Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Meth Al-Hamli. I'm a marine threatened, uh, threatened species and habitat specialist from the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi. Here in the AGC, we have been working um, for the past three years in collaboration with the Marine Biology Lab at New York University, Abu Dhabi, to establish a coral reef monitoring uh, program to help guide management and conservation of coral reefs in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Tonight's lecture, Coral Reef of the Gulf and the a Unique Ecosystem, is being presented by Dr. John Burt. Uh, Dr. John Burt is the head of Marine Biology Lab and uh, an assistant professor of biology in uh, the uh, Univer New York University here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this lecture is uh, a public component of a large week-long event being hosted by NYU AD Institute, and we thank them for this workshop. It's titled Conservation Coral Reefs in the Gulf, a Capacity Building Workshop. This workshop aims to enhance dialogue and collaboration among coral reef scientists and managers working on Gulf reefs and includes participants from various Gulf countries including Kuwait, Iran, Bahrain, Oman, and the UAE, as well as a number of international delegates here with us. This workshop being being the first of its kind has helped us set up a base for a Gulf-wide network where we'll be sharing our findings with other Gulf states. This will help us better understand and preserve this fragile ecosystem. I'll speak a little bit about Dr. John Burt. Dr. John Burt has his Bachelor of Science from Cape, Cape Burton University, and he has a PhD from the University of Windsor in Canada. His lab uses the Arabian Gulf is a natural laboratory to study coral reef ecology in extreme environments. Um, he also works on understanding how these, uh, the, the habitat of the, the coral in the Gulf can serve as a module for potential impact of climate change on reefs elsewhere in the world. He also continues to study the ecological and management implications of coastal development in urban areas and seeks to develop a more sustainable coastal management in the Gulf. I look forward to learning more about these fascinating ecology of coral reefs and uh, I look forward to welcoming Dr. John Burt and listening to his lecture. I hope you enjoy. Um, it's really actually nice to see so much interest in uh, coral reef ecology and conservation um, in a place like Abu Dhabi, it's, it's wonderful to have people here. Um, I see there's a variety of students from NYU here. Thank you for coming. Um, as well as people from the natural history groups and diving, uh, people from the Emirates Diving Association. So it's, it's wonderful to have you guys. Um, tonight I'll be talking about coral reefs in the Gulf, and I'll be putting this in the larger context of what's going on globally, and then minnowing our way down into what is actually going on in the Gulf in terms of our science and things that are threatening these reefs and potentially what we can do about it. But I thought I'd start by uh, putting up a slide just illustrating what some of the coral reefs around this area look like. Um, this is a, a photograph that was taken just maybe two months ago at Sirbunair, which is a small island that's about 45 minutes out from either Dubai or Abu Dhabi. It's sort of in between. Um, and you can see there's a variety of branching corals there. Um, there's some mound corals on the bottom and a variety of different reef fish that are associated with it. Um, it's a beautiful place to work on some of these reefs um, and uh, just a fascinating ecosystem to study. Um, I guess to get started we should talk first about the importance of coral reefs generally. Um, coral reefs are known as the rainforests of the sea. They contain 1% or sorry they cover 1% of the world's sea bottoms but there's 25% of the marine species on earth live on coral reefs. So they're a very important ecosystem in terms of diversity. And they're also highly productive. They provide a lot of energy and habitat for other reef-associated organisms that sometimes carry that energy elsewhere. Um, they're not only ecologically important, but they're also important for us as humans um, in terms of things like uh, protection from wave activity on oceanic atolls, for example, um, to the obvious uh, food sources that we use them for, for fisheries and so on. And they're estimated to be worth uh, nearly $400 billion a year in these services and products that they provide us. Um, and they're particularly important, of course, in developing countries. And this, this map is showing you 
basically the area where the diversity of coral is centered. And if you look at the coloration of the different nations that are on the map, you can see that they're associated with GDP. And so where we get the most coral is generally in areas that have the least money to actually conserve and protect them. Um, and they're important in those areas because they, in many areas, provide up to 20% of the protein that people are eating. Um, but as you're aware, the climate is changing, and this is mainly the result of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, as well as a few others. Um, and this, this graphic is, is showing you the Keeling curve, named after the fellow who discovered sort of the trend going on with carbon dioxide. Um, and you can see it fluctuates from year to year, and that's just basically through the seasons. The northern hemisphere has more land area with plants growing on it, sucking that carbon dioxide out of the air. And so you'll see it drop down through this, the northern summer, and then it'll rise back up in the winter when all the leaves fall off the trees. And it fluctuates, but what you'll notice is on the decadal scale, there's been an onward march of uh, carbon dioxide increasing through time. And I'm not sure when Kyoto Protocol was actually signed, but I think it was in around 92, and you can see that it's had negligible impact on sort of the amount of carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere. Um, this carbon dioxide uh, has reached 397 parts per million as of July this year. Um, and there was a paper just out a few years ago by a few of the grandfathers of coral reef science who basically said if we want to keep reefs at the sort of state um, that we consider pristine, we need to have 350 parts per million as our target. Um, you can see we've well exceeded that, and we exceeded it in about 1990, and so it continues. And in association with the uh, increase in CO2, we've had um, increases in temperature. Um, and this is happening in the atmosphere as well as in the seas. And this is a, a graphic basically showing you that, you know, if you take the average of uh, sea temperatures from 1951 to 1980, and you plot the difference from that average, you can see that in the last uh, several decades, we've had temperature spikes uh, year on year on year. So things are getting warmer. And as a result of this warming, there's two major ecosystems that are under critical stress, and those are the Arctic, uh, where temperatures are shifting very rapidly, as well as uh, coral reefs. Um, now, the reason that we're concerned about um, the increase in CO2 and the thermal effects that this causes is because sometimes stresses like uh, increased thermal stress will cause a, a breakdown of the relationship between coral and the algae that live in it. So if you look at this uh, graphic on the bottom, you can see this polyp. This is what a coral actually looks like. It looks more like a jellyfish, and it's a close relative of jellyfish, basically sitting upside down. But you'll notice these sort of brownish colored dots. I'm, I'm colorblind, so I think that's brown. Um, these brownish colored dots um, that are associated with it. That is what are called zooxanthellae. They're an algae that live inside the coral. And basically what happens is the sunlight hits the coral, and uh, these guys are doing photosynthesis. They get sugar. Um, they produce that sugar, and some of it gets funneled off to the uh, coral itself, which feeds off of it. Um, in exchange, what the coral does is it basically picks plankton out of the water, pulls nutrients in, and feeds it to the, the algae. Um, because generally, in places where coral reefs grow, there's not enough nutrients to keep things going. So this is a symbiotic relationship that's very important. And when you look at a reef and you see you know, all of these brown and orange and other bright colors, um, what you're looking at is not the coral itself, but the algae that's associated with the coral. Um, but what sometimes happens is you'll get a stress event. And in this context, we're talking about thermal stress. And what'll happen is you'll get a breakdown of that relationship. Um, you know, the corals may digest the uh, zooxanthellae, the algae that are associated with it, or they may expel them. There's various different mechanisms. Um, but what happens is you'll see a coral turning white and losing its coloration. So you can see here there's still some brown bits on the end of this table coral, uh, but there's large patches of white. And what you're looking at there is uh, basically the coral skeleton that lies underneath that gelatinous tissue. So you can see its skeleton itself. Um, if you look at this on a larger scale, this is a picture of Dubai, one of the reefs in Dubai from 2007. You'll see this as a paling in some cases, or in other cases, you'll see it as a complete bleaching. And that's where the term coral bleaching comes from. Um, and at this point, there are no zooxanthellae associated with these coral, or very few. Um, and so these corals are not getting food. And so they can survive for a few days or potentially weeks off of the fat stores that they have in their tissues. But at some point, they're going to die of starvation, unless conditions improve and the zooxanthellae come back into their tissue. 
And if you look, you know, in the larger context with the climate change that I've been talking about, there's been an increase in the number of bleaching events uh, that have occurred through time. The biggest one is here in 1998, that was an El Nino year, it was very extreme. Worldwide we had uh, very significant bleaching events that year. Uh, but you can see that there's been an increase through time. And uh, the pattern's been increasing through time and spatially, this is basically everywhere on Earth we're getting these bleaching events. And so you can see it clustered through the Indo-Pacific area, the Indian Ocean, our Gulf here, as well as the Caribbean, uh, have experienced severe bleaching events. And as a result of these bleaching events and the breakdown of that relationship that occurs, uh, coral's been going into decline. Now, it's not entirely due to climate change. Climate change estimated at this point only to be about 10% of what's going on with these reefs, the decline of reefs. So there's other contributors as well. Humans are changing the way lands are used, and that's resulting in sediments running off into the sea, nutrients going into the sea. Um, there's been breakouts of um, uh, coral eating uh, starfish in some areas and diseases and so on. Um, but you can see through time, in, this is the Caribbean and this is the Great Barrier Reef, there's been a decrease in the amount of live coral that's, that exists in these habitats. Um, in this paper, which was just published last year, there's actually been a 50% decrease in the amount of coral in the areas that were surveyed on the Great Barrier Reef since the mid-1980s. So this is a significant problem. And the likelihood of things getting better based on current projections with CO2 is not great. Um, this is projection showing that, you know, basically, depending on which scenario we follow in terms of the carbon dioxide going into the air, we're going to have roughly a two to four degree increase in temperatures over the next century. So things are going to get warmer. <clears throat> and of course, this is associated with increased loss of corals. And so this is basically taking the data that we looked at earlier and projecting it into the future. Um, you know, roughly the mid-2030s or mid-2040s, uh, you'll see the loss of reefs at these current rates, unless things change. Um, and looking at the amount of CO2 and what's projected to happen, so 375 we've passed already. Uh, we're at close to 400 now. 450 parts per million, we, we're going to hit at about the mid-2030s. Um, at that point, you're going to start seeing a breakdown of uh, coral reefs, and you're going to see algae starting to dominate these habitats. And if carbon dioxide continues increasing, you'll lose coral altogether. The reefs will degrade, and we'll be left with basically a framework that algae grows on <laughs> and no live coral. Um, now, whether or not this happens versus this depends on us as humans, what we decide to do on sort of a policy level. Um, it's also still unclear how the ocean's going to respond to um, the increases in CO2 that are going in there. Um, but there's also how organisms may respond. And the question is, can corals adapt or will they disappear for this time frame? Which brings us to the Gulf. Um, I don't know if most people are familiar with the sort of natural history of the Gulf, but just let me step back for a second and say that this is a really interesting sea to work on because the Gulf itself is very shallow. If you look at the Gulf of Oman, depths there go down to sort of 1,000 meters plus. Uh, it's quite deep uh, in areas quite well mixed. There's a lot of nutrients and so on. The Gulf itself is very shallow. Um, generally, in most coastal areas off of Abu Dhabi, you're lucky if you hit 20 meters, maybe 25. And you can continue going across the Gulf, and the deepest place that you'll get over towards Iran is around 90 meters. So it's a very shallow sea. And as a result of this uh, shallow depth, we can have extreme changes in temperature through the seasons. And so if you look at the temperatures in winter, in Kuwait, it'll go down into the low teens on a regular basis. Even down here in Abu Dhabi, I've had temperature loggers on reefs which have reached 13 degrees Celsius. And this is very cold for areas where you have coral. Um, on the other extreme, just six months later, we go from January through to August, temperatures rocket up um, by 20 degrees, and you'll get temperatures in the southern basin of the Gulf hitting 36 degrees Celsius, regularly hitting 35 degrees Celsius. And to put that into context, when you take a, a hot bath at home, when you draw a bath and you dip your foot in it before soaking completely, usually that water's at around 40 degrees Celsius. And any of you who have gone swimming in the summertime in Abu Dhabi know exactly what I mean. This is very hot water. Um, yet we do have coral reefs that exist throughout this area. So this is interesting. So 
Coral reefs in most areas are being threatened by climate change and the thermal effects that are coming with it, but we do have corals that exist here. Um, and this is the world's hottest sea, so it does, in a way, serve as a model for what might happen in other areas, so it's of interest to science. And we regularly, so these are temperatures from Abu Dhabi in 2007 and then 2010, which was a little bit warmer, um, through July and August and September, and you can see them regularly sitting at around 35 or 36 degrees Celsius. And these are temperatures that aren't expected in the low latitude tropics for at least the next century. Um, so it's an interesting system. And when you look at it in comparison to other areas, there's a lot to be told. Um, if you look at just this first line, number one here, so we've got red lines and we've got blue lines. The red lines represent reefs in uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and the blue lines represent reefs in the Caribbean. And if you look at this, the, the first one that's labeled one here, it, what this is saying is that basically at 29 degrees Celsius in Heron Island, it can sit for 40 days before things go, uh, things start to go south and bleaching will occur. But if you increase that temperature to 30 degrees Celsius, you will have bleaching immediately, zero days. And so you can look at this cluster of points for the, C, uh, the GBR, the Great Barrier Reef, or the Caribbean, and you can see that it's, it's quite low temperatures. You know, you're talking 31.5, 32 at the outside. The Gulf here, we regularly experience temperatures up into the upper 30s. Um, and so you can sit a, a coral here at 34 degrees Celsius for over two months and it'll cope with that. So it's rather interesting. And so it repre represents an opportunity for us as scientists to basically look at this system and see what's going on. Um, so there's been growing interest, and this is international as well as regional in terms of what information this, this system can offer to us. This is a, um, a conference that I hosted a year and a half ago um, where we brought in people from pretty much every continent on Earth except to Antarctica because we don't have a city there yet. Um, uh, but we had people from 19 different countries. There's, I think, maybe 300, 350 people registered for the conference. So there is a lot of interest in Gulf reefs, and as a result of this interest, there's been rapid growth in reef science in the region. And so this graph is basically showing you the bars represent how many papers were published per year, which is shown, uh, it's being cut off um, on this side. But you can look at the red trend line, which is basically the cumulative number of publications through time. And you can see we're hitting 275 um, articles on coral reefs in the Gulf uh, over just a couple of decades. And 50% of those publications occurred just in the last decade. And so it's been very rapid growth in terms of interest in this area. So some people are working on uh, reef fish communities. So I've done a bit of work on this myself, but a lot of the work's been done by David Fury and some of his colleagues. Um, and Basically, we're interested in looking at the Gulf, but you need to compare it to other areas. So we looked also at the Gulf of Oman, uh, at a number of sites there, as well as in southern Oman in the Arabian Sea for comparative purposes. Now, the Gulf of Oman, as I mentioned earlier, is much deeper, and so you don't tend to get the extremes in temperatures that you do uh, in this region. Um, whereas in the south of Oman, it's actually quite cool because of the upwelling that occurs in the summertime associated with the monsoon. And so it makes for a nice sort of biogeographic picture if you want to understand how coral reef fishes might respond. Um, and so Dave et al. went out and surveyed reefs uh, throughout 24 different sites along more than 3,000 kilometers of coast um, and looked at a variety of different sort of community parameters. Um, one thing we notice is that the Arabian Gulf has a, a lot fewer species than you tend to get um, in the Gulf of Oman and Arabian Sea. And again, that's, that's not too much of a surprise given the extreme environment that we have here. Um, abundance is also low here. We get many fewer fish than you tend to get in either uh, the Gulf of Oman or the Arabian Sea. Um, there's a lot of fishing in the Arabian Sea, which probably explains the, uh, the, the low numbers there, as well as the cold temperatures. Um, but in particular, if you look at biomass, so the number or how many kilograms of fish per hectare, um, you'll notice that there's much lower biomass of coral reef fishes in the Arabian Gulf than you tend to get in the other areas. And the reason for this is, yeah, well, we might have reasonably comparable abundance to um, the Arabian Sea, for example, but the fish here are much, much smaller. Um, so if you take a mature, let's say, hamor in the Arabian Sea versus a mature hamor here, um, there's a huge difference in the size of these things. And as a result, there's a lot less biomass in the system. Um, the fish here are also weird. Um, they eat funny things. Um, and so this is just showing a breakdown of different 
types of fish and what they like to eat. So you've got predators, basically, in blue here, and herbivores, things that eat algae on reefs. Um, they make up together 98% of all the sort of trophic groups or feeding groups that we see in reef fishes here. And if you look at the Gulf of Oman or the Arabian Sea, they've got a much more diverse um, variety of foods that they eat in those areas. Um, we're currently looking at, uh, this is in particular, Andrew Hoey's looking at this, uh, the feeding habits of the Arabian angelfish, which I like to refer to as the rat of the sea. Um, in most coral reef areas, if you go diving, you might see one or two of these guys on a dive. Here you'll see hundreds, literally, of this guy. Um, and he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. Um, in most areas, these guys eat sponge. Here they eat a lot of algae and other stuff. So they're taking on functional roles on these reefs that are usually restricted to other fish that don't exist here. Um, and so we have uh, a really unique environment here, and it does give us some information. You know, if we're interested in climate change, we can start looking at systems like this, communities like this, to figure out, okay, we've got this extreme environment now. What's likely to happen on reefs in other areas in the future as things heat up? And so we're starting to get at that with fish, looking at the patterns of communities there. Um, we're also interested in corals. Um, Andrew Bauman's done a lot of this work, uh, who's in the room um, as well. And we sample 18 sites across the UAE, up in the Musandam Peninsula, and down along the coast of Oman, looking at the coral communities in these areas. Um, and if you look at the number of coral species um, that you see in, in the Arabian Gulf, again, the number's quite low uh, compared to what you get in other areas. And again, it's that extreme environment, so that's not too much of a surprise. Um, coral cover, the, we call it coral cover. It's basically the abundance of corals, or what percent of the sea bottom is covered by live coral. Um, is actually quite high in the southern Gulf compared to the Gulf of Oman, but the Gulf of Oman's had a couple of impacts in the last few years which have uh, nailed down corals. Um, Strait of Hormuz, it, if you're not a diver yet, or if you are a diver and haven't gone to the Strait of Hormuz, you need to get up there and look at these reefs. They're fantastic. They're the best in the region, in my opinion. Um, and again, when you start looking at the composition of these communities, what makes up the different corals that we see on these reefs, um, the coral composition in this area is a bit weird. Um, Phryites, the pink color here, which is basically a mound coral, like this guy that's over here, see this mound in the background? Um, they make up well over half of the corals that you see on reefs here. And then you get another group over here, the platygyra, the brain corals, um, also make up a significant contribution. So those make up basically 75% of all the corals that you see on reefs here in the Gulf. And if you look at the Musandam, you start to see a transition, and into the Gulf of Oman, you get a much more diverse community um, on those reefs, and it's not fully dominated. So, you know, there's shifts. There's certain types of corals which can survive in the environment here um, that do well, whereas others can't. And again, so this gives us some information on what reefs might look like in the future in other areas, just based on the thermal stress. <clears throat> and you know, so this is piquing our interest. We've been looking a lot at, at the patterns of what goes on in these communities, what the communities themselves look like. But in recent years, there's been an interest in looking at, okay, we now know the patterns. What's making these guys tick? What allows them to survive in these environments where normally things would be dead? Um, if you took the Great Barrier Reef and notched it up to 32 degrees Celsius, Celsius all the fish, or virtually all of the fish, and all of the corals would be gone. Here we hit 35, 36 every summer. So what is it that let these, lets these guys tick through? Um, and you can see this pink line here represents this physiology and molecular biology approach. It's only recently that people have started looking at it, and I think this is where we're going to see the most rapid growth in the coming decade in terms of our understanding of what's going on in these reefs. Um, one area that uh, I have a collaborator working on with me is Jenny Donaldson. She's at James Cook University, and she's interested in basically how thermal stress affects fish. Um, Basically, if you, you know, just like a human, if you sit us outside, we're going to start to get hot and we're going to start breathing quickly. So our cardiovascular system is going to pick up and so on. And what happens with fish is as you warm them up, their cardiovascular system is going to pick up and their heart's going to start beating faster. And they're trying to supply oxygen to their blood to, or to their tissues to support metabolism. But at a certain point, their heart can no longer pump fast enough to get the oxygen there. And these fish basically suffocate to death because their system can't cope with it. Um, one of the types of fishes that uh, um, Jenny does a lot of work on are the cardinal fishes, and uh, because they're particularly susceptible to this. And she's done some, uh, I'm just showing you a little bit of her data. Um, she'll be publishing this hopefully in the next half a year or so. 
But basically, if you look at the blue line here, this is the Gulf of Oman with this species of fish, the five line cardinal fish. And you can see the survivorship at different temperatures, so 32, 33, 34, and so on, in terms of temperature. And you can see there's high survivorship you know, up until about 34, and then things start to go south very quickly. And so you'll get fish dying off basically after you cross 34 degrees Celsius in the Gulf of Oman. Whereas in the Arabian Gulf, you keep fish ticking across to 35, then you start to see a decline. So they can cope with uh, higher maximum temperatures than you see in the Gulf of Oman. And she's done this for a number of different species, which I put pictures of on the bottom. And you can see for some of them, they only exist in the Gulf of Oman. And you'll notice those ones that are in the, only in the Gulf of Oman, like this guy here, um, this guy here, they may exist here, but they'll be extremely rare. Um, basically, they start collapsing at very sort of low by Gulf standards temperatures, and that's probably why you don't see them very much here. Um, whereas these guys tend to do fine. Um, this, this fellow in particular, you see them all over reefs here in Abu Dhabi, and they're ticking along at 38, 39 degrees Celsius before they start to basically die from that suffocation I talked about. Um, one interesting sort of side note that I don't have data here for, though, is that when you look at the Gulf of Oman, they can basically take three, four degrees, actually it's more like four or five degrees above their normal summer maximum, then they die. The Gulf fish can only take about three degrees and then they'll die. So they're basically at their limits already. So if we increase the water here just a bit more, it's gonna have a lot um, faster effects than you'll get in the Gulf of Oman. Um, other sort of getting into the, the, the mechanistic side, what are things that make these guys tick? Um, corals, as I mentioned earlier, have that association with zooxanthellae. Um, the zoos are basically made up of one group called the symbiodinium. Um, and the symbiodinium basically were once considered a single species of algae about 20 years ago. And since then, we know now that they're actually a whole bunch of different things. And first, it was broken up into six different clades, we call them, or six different groups of these algae. And that's further been broken down into a whole bunch of different subclades. And so we're still learning more and more about these zooxanthellae that are associated with corals. Um, some work has been done on Gulf symbionts, not a whole lot. Um, there's been work that was done by Andrew Baker, who's at the University of Miami, um, back in around 2001. Um, which was after that 1998 bleaching event. Um, and he sampled off the coast of Saudi, um, looked at the clades of algae that were associated with corals there, and he saw a high dominance of what's called clade D. And clade D is basically this thermotolerant guy um, who is often found in areas where you have extreme environments. And so, um, you know, this suggests, okay, the Gulf is a very hostile location. It's not really a surprise that we see D here. Some further work was done by a group uh, in Iran, uh, out of Pergol Mostafavi's lab. Um, and she, again, same sort of story there. Out of the 14 species that they looked at, 12 of them had D, and 10 of them basically were exclusively clay D. And so we're seeing that, okay, the, the communities in this area are dominated by this guy that's known to be thermal tolerant. That's not too, too much of a surprise. So I started a collaboration back in 2010 with Jorg Wiedenman, who's at the University of Southampton. Um, and we'd been talking about different projects, and he came down and we sampled some reefs off of Abu Dhabi, just here in the Bia and Sadiat, to look at what sort of clades were associated with the, uh, the communities there. Um, and this is work done by his student, Ben Hume, um, and we looked at six different species of corals, and each of these bars basically represents what we saw in that coral. And you can see D is nowhere to be found in the southern gulf. Um, it does not exist. Um, so what we typically see is actually a dominance of uh, C3, this green color here. I think it's green. Um, C3 is what's dominating corals here in the southern gulf. Um, and what this suggests is that, well, clay D, yeah, it is in a lot of inhospitable environments, but it's not a prerequisite for survival in those inhospitable environments. And what we're actually seeing is C3, which is often known as a generalist. It's one that's not known to be in extreme areas. And so there's something weird going on here um, and very interesting. And um, one reason that could possibly explain why we don't get the Ds down here um, that we do did, did, did see in Iran and uh, Saudi is that there's differences between these clades. Um, clade D, for example, is known to be greedy. Um, so I said before that sugars are transmitted from these guys into the corals. Um, D keeps a lot of that sugars for itself. And you'll see this, for example, here. 
Um, this is juvenile growth rates with one that's associated with D versus one that's associated with C. And you can see the growth rates are much higher in the corals that contain C. And this is done with adults, and it's the same sort of story here, both in the lab and in the field. If you have D, growth rates tend to be much slower than uh, if you have C. So maybe it has something to do with the, uh, the, the trade-offs that go with having a C versus D. There's also things like some of the sampling that was done in Iran, for example, was done in tidal pools, which are even more extreme than most areas. So there's a lot of unanswered questions that we're still looking into. But going back to this slide for a second, one of the more interesting things are, are these group of corals up here, the parites, the mound corals that I talked about earlier, um, which are basically entirely dominated by C3, except for this one odd colony up here. Um, and what's interesting about that is if you look at the literature, which Ben has done, and you look I think he looked at something like 40 different publications in terms of what clades were associated with these different species of corals. And you can see the picture here. It, all around the world, it's this one C15 um, that's found in every single coral that's been sampled in all of the studies that he looked, like, looked at for these two species of corals here. And so normally, they're associated with that C15. But here, it doesn't exist at all. Zero corals had it. Um, and it was completely C3 dominated. So there's something odd going on in the southern Gulf. What the mechanisms are that are um, allowing this to happen, what is going on in terms of the biology is something that we're continuing to look at now. Um, ben and uh, others in his lab and my lab have basically taken the study a bit further and sampled farther afield. So we started at Delma, moved across the Gulf, up through the Musandam Peninsula and down to Muscat itself and looked at a whole bunch of different sites in that area and looked at the breakdown of these clades in these different habitats. And what you can see is all the way through the southern Gulf, all the way through to Ras al um, C3 completely dominates those parades, those mound corals again. And it's only as soon as you leave the Musandam and you start going into the Gulf of Oman, you see C3 basically starting to disappear as a gradient as you go down the coast. And C15 starts to reappear. Um, one of the areas that we're looking at in terms of the possible explanation for this is that it's a salinity and a thermal effect. Because the southern Gulf, because it's again shallow, we have high temperatures, there's a lot of evaporation here. So we have very salty water. So perhaps this is contributing to it. And we've, um, um, York has some experiments going on with this right now in his lab at Southampton um, with very interesting results coming out of it. So um, basically, the UAE corals have this really unique association. It's, it's unusual and very informative. And we've got a lot of other projects on the go. Uh, Emily Howells, who's in my lab, is a postdoctoral researcher. Um, she's basically looking at you know, using long-term monitoring to inform our uh, understanding of these systems. She's looking at things like growth rates, um, how much reproduction is going on with these guys. If you're in this really extreme environment, do you still produce as many eggs as you do in the Gulf of Oman or not? Um, and how susceptible are the different species to the, the bleaching that occurs? Um, she's also doing some interesting work doing some cross-fertilization. So she's taken eggs and sperm from corals here in um, Abu Dhabi. Uh, just to back up for a second, uh, this is a, a, an egg and sperm bundle being released. So these guys basically, we can predict when they're going to, for the most part, uh, release their eggs and sperm, uh, which basically occurs on the full moon in April over a couple of days. And so you go out at night and you'll see these guys releasing their eggs and sperm. So Emily's been collecting eggs and sperm from corals um, in the southern Gulf, as well as uh, over in, in Fujairah, and then cross-fertilizing to see if the thermal tolerance that we see in the corals, does it translate into the next generation uh, or into the larvae themselves? The, um, the interesting thing about this is that when you look at larvae, they, know, they have no zooxanthellae in the species that she's looking at. Um, and so what you're actually looking at is not the zooxanthellae, but the coral itself. And that lets you pull out some other information. Um, she's also looking at things like, um, you know, do the thermal tolerance that we see in the adults, does that also occur in the juveniles, uh, and so on. Um, another fellow who's working in my lab, Ed Smith, is interested in looking at the genetics of these things in terms of the populations. So we have this group of uh, organisms down here that are very tolerant. How, how many of these larvae might end up getting out of the Gulf and basically seeding reefs in the Indian Ocean and maybe even further afield down the road through evolutionary time? And so Ed's been sampling all through the coast and uh, looking at sort of the connectivity of these, these populations um, in terms of retention within the Gulf itself and, and potentially moving outwards. 
um, and looking at the coral host again rather than just the zooxanthellae. What's making these guys tick? What's so special about them? Um, are there biomarkers that we can use to identify these really hardy fellows? Um, he's also interested in looking at basically the odd environment that we have here. Yes, it gets very, very hot in the summer, but some of you probably know, so this is showing you temperature over here, and yes, it gets hot in August and September. Big surprise. But you've probably noticed, but never really paid attention to the fact that every summer it also gets really hazy uh, here in the Gulf. And that's what this is showing over here. Now there's two things that sort of lead to bleaching. One of them is the thermal side of it, but there's also the light. And so perhaps the environment here is actually giving a sort of, if you want to think of it, a sunscreen or a, a filter that's reducing the light stress that's hitting these corals and allowing them to keep going. So um, lots of questions. So that's just a taste of what's going on in terms of the uh, research um, that's been going on recently. Um, but I'm going to switch directions now and talk a little bit more on the conservation side. Um, the Gulf, you know, looking at this picture, is a very small system and its borders are shared by eight different countries. And each of those countries have populations that are growing, economies that are growing, and there's a lot of stressors that are going into this small, fragile ecosystem that I've just talked about. And so the Gulf is basically increasingly under threat. And this threat has been um, ramping up over the last couple of decades. Um, in the 1990s, the biggest sort of stressor to hit reefs here was uh, one was associated with an El Nino event, the other one was a little bit earlier, but basically corals bleached. So prior to 1995, reefs in the southern gulf were dominated by branching corals. Um, these guys are important because they provide a lot of habitat for fish and juveniles and so on. Um, so prior to 1995, that's basically what reefs looked like and the one picture that I showed you earlier. In 1996 and again in 1998, the normal summer temperatures got exceeded by two degrees Celsius and it basically hammered corals throughout the world in 1998, but here in the Gulf as well. And what we had was a lot of the more sensitive corals, particularly these acropora, the branching corals, uh, died off in 1996. And then in 1998, it was sort of the nail in the coffin for the acropora. Any that were left at that time uh, were decimated. And we had a transition from basically these table coral dominated reefs to ones that look like this, where basically we only have those prites, the mound corals, and the brain corals left over. So that was the first sort of major stressor. And it's, it's not something that's happened for the very first time in the Gulf. We've known that these have, you know, things are living at the limits of their tolerance. And so if you give it any additional stress, um, you can have impacts. And we can see back in the 1950s and 60s, there's been reports of some bleaching events that occurred there due to cold temperatures, actually. But you can see from the 1980s, we're getting repeated mass mortality of corals as a result of high temperatures. Um, and you can see the frequency of these is increasing over the last decade. Whoops, excuse me. Um, and so what we're getting is, you know, reefs that used to look like this are transitioning into reefs that look like this, where you'll have an occasional table coral, uh, and then to reefs that look like this, where you basically only get a little patch of coral um, that's alive, and most of the reef is dead. Um, and we see this in the southern gulf uh, very clearly. Areas that are further to the east where temperatures are nicer, you will get a cropera, but as you go west towards the border of Qatar, it looks like this and then this. Coastal development's a further stressor that's really sort of ramped up in the last decade, and it's happening all over the Gulf, as you're aware. Um, and just as a case study on that, this is a study I did in Bahrain uh, a year or two ago. And this is showing you the, uh, the coastline of Bahrain in 1973 versus 2012. They've actually added 11% more land mass to Bahrain through reclamation. Um, and so now 90% of the coastline in Bahrain is uh, human-made. Um, and you can look even closer at the reefs themselves. This is called the Fasht al Adam, which is a reef that basically extends from the coast of Manama over towards Qatar. And you'll notice there's, it's hard to see because of the lights, but there's some dredge channels coming through here, so they've directly burrowed through reefs for dredging. Um, you'll also notice these odd lines that are crisscrossing um, the, the reef itself. That's seismic surveys for oil and gas, so they're actually putting explosives on the reef itself uh, back in the 1980s, and it's never recovered from that. Um, and so I did a study with uh, uh, one of the ministries in Bahrain to look at coral reefs there, and we looked all around Bahrain, including an area way offshore, um, and looked at the amount of coral that was on these reefs. And so this is showing you the coral cover again, how much, what percent of a square meter is covered by coral. Uh, and you can see that the sort of highest is about 20%. Um, Fasht al way offshore has about 10%, but most of them are quite low, and the average is around 
And just to put that into context, that's 5%. This study was just done two years ago. Um, back in 1985, Fashel Adam had over 50, upwards of 90% coral cover recorded on these reefs. Um, Bolthama, the, the site that was far offshore, just as close back as 2003, had 50% of the bottom was covered by coral. Now it's down to 20% because of yet another bleaching event in 2010. Um, other stressors, the cyclone, cyclone Ganu, uh, which some of you experienced while you lived here in 2007, caused uh, storm surge that went inland for several kilometers in some cases and 10 meter high waves. That basically resulted in the loss of uh, s smaller branching corals like these guys here. And coral cover went from around 30 or 40 percent down to the low 30s on average. So it, it had a little bit of an effect, but not too much. But this was followed very closely by a red tide that uh, many of you may remember in 2008 that extended through 2009. And this is showing that red tide moving into the Gulf itself. So it came into the Gulf along the coast of Iran. And this picture here is the coastline of Dubai during the peak of that event. And that caused you know, massive fish mortality and coral mortality as well. Um, I did a project just a couple of years ago with the uh, um, Fujairah municipality and surveyed a number of different sites along their coast. And this is again showing you how much coral is associated with these different sites. And so you're averaging around 10% coral cover. Um, prior to the red tide and Cyclone Gano, uh, it was estimated that there was around 30 to 40% of the sea bottom was covered with uh, coral. Now it's down to 10%. Um, and in certain areas where you had very sensitive corals, uh, like Dibba Rock, which many of you may have snorkeled on if you went out to Alaka or to um, the Meridian. Um, you know, it's down at around 3% now, and it was at 55% five, uh, coral coverage back in the day. Murabah is another reef that was at 33%. We have documents for these. It's been halved. So it's a sad story for what's happened basically really in the last two decades in the Gulf. As a you know, combination of both anthropogenic stressors as well as natural sort of stress events. Um, and if you look globally, humans are having an impact on reefs. And you know, basically, on a global scale, we've lost about 20% or a fifth of uh, reefs on Earth. Um, but there are still about 50% of reefs are considered to be at relatively low threat level. Um, when you look at the Gulf, um, the this, this story's very um, pessimistic. Um, and it's estimated that we've lost 70% of the reefs that have existed in the Gulf, again, as a result of both natural stressors and human activity. Um, and Clive Wilkinson, the fellow who writes the sort of Bible on coral reefs every four years, or the Quran, if you like, um, uh, calls these amongst the most damaged reefs in the world. So as a result, there have been, in the last couple of years, growing calls for improved management of reefs in these areas. Um, and as you can see from the red line here, from the 1980s through, you can see there's been rapid growth, particularly in the last decade, where we've added sort of 50% more publications in this area. Um, and it now makes up basically 15% of all the reef science that's been done in the Gulf is made up by conservation and management type uh, studies. Um, but this management, for the most part, has been reactive. Um, so something has happened and management has tried to step in to solve the problem after the fact. And it's only with science and collection of data and long-term monitoring that we're going to be able to actually improve the management of these systems through proactive actions. Um, and this is just showing you, you know, in terms of the science that's been done in the Gulf, where has it been done? And you can see Bahrain, Iran, and so on. And the UAE is over here amongst uh, papers that have been published in multiple Gulf countries. And you can see the, that we've published a lot of science on reefs in this region, particularly in the UAE. But when you start looking at the breakdown of who's actually doing the science, one thing that you'll note is that Gulf nationals aren't the ones doing the science. Uh, the science is typically being done by people who are from um, North America or Europe. Um, and this is particularly true in the UAE, where only about a third of the science is being published by people who are based in the UAE. And so there's really a need for more engagement of the GCC nationals in the, the science effort that's going on here if we want to improve management. Um, so there's various efforts that are going on to try and increase this dialogue. Um, if you're interested, there's a, 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 a site that Jörg Wiedemann and I have put together which is called the Mideast Coral Reef Society, and you can find it here, so Mideast CRS, um, where we're basically trying to increase engagement with uh, the community at large, and it doesn't have to be GCC nationals, to start more dialogue on what's going on with reefs in this area. Um, the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute uh, is, has a very strong effort 
going towards uh, development of GCC nationals through professional development workshops, capacity building, and so on. And this is just some pictures from a workshop that I had back in May, as well as one that's going on now. And you know, we're, we're in the classroom, we're doing stuff in the field. Um, this is a picture that was taken by Mohammed Abdullah, who's uh, somewhere in the room tonight, um, using a blue light torch at night, just to, on Monday. Um, so some fantastic stuff going on. Another diver here learning how to census reef fish and so on. Some people learning how to do um, quadrat analysis so we can find out how much coral is living on reefs. Um, there's also been strong institutional collaboration that's been building across the Gulf in the last couple of years. And just as one example, we have a long relationship with the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi, which has been quite successful. Um, it's led to a number of publications, uh, presentations at science conferences and so on. Um, which is basically monitoring, over the long term, the reefs in Abu Dhabi. So we're looking at 10 sites across 350 uh, kilometers of coastline here to sort of track what changes are going on in these reefs, as well as answer uh, other questions. And uh, we're currently in the process, and part of the point of the workshop that I'm having this week is to establish a regional network. There's not much point in establishing really good management here in Abu Dhabi, for example, if the coastline down the road is not being well managed, because Environmental issues don't, don't recognize these boundaries of uh, nations. And so, you know, when you talk about the circulation of the Gulf, water comes in here, moves along the Iranian coast, circulates back down this way and back out again over three to five years. So anything that's going on up here or here is also going to potentially affect the reefs in Abu Dhabi. So it's only if we start looking at this from a regional perspective that we're actually going to see improvement um, in conservation and management in this area. Um, so what's the future of Gulf reefs? Well, that depends. Um, basically, the time for action is now um, to either stem the decline of what's going on and perhaps promote the recovery of these reefs. Um, and it's only with the engagement of GCC nationals um, and through capacity building that we can develop these long-term sort of collaborative um, efforts that might lead to the establishment of a regional network and the conservation of these uh, important ecosystems. Um, I'd just like to thank some people um, before I exit the stage. Um, in my own lab here is uh, Emily Howells and Ed Smith, my postdocs, Grace Bond, my research, or sorry, lab manager, um, and Dane McCarland, who's new to the lab and I have no appropriate pictures for, um, <laughs> at the University of Southampton, where we've had a very good relationship over the last couple of years. The lab is read by, uh, run by Jörg Wiedemann. Um, and Ben Hume and C.C. D'Angelo are in there doing most of the work while Jorg sends me emails. Um, Andrew Bowman did a lot of the coral work that I talked about earlier. Dave Ferry did a lot of the fish work that I talked about earlier. Jenny Donaldson um, and uh, uh, Andrew Hoey uh, do fish stuff as well. Um, and I'd like to thank these groups for their logistics support, funding, and so on. Thank you. So you discussed temperature, but with the rise in temperature comes a lowering of pH, and the exoskeleton or endoskeleton of a coral is calcium and magnesium carbonate. Correct. And it's more soluble under acidic conditions than, so can you comment on sure. the lowering of the pH? So the large elephant in the room that I did not talk about is ocean acidification. Um, so that carbon dioxide graph that I showed you earlier is, yes, related to an increase in temperatures going up, but it's also related to a decrease in the pH of the oceanic water because carbon dioxide is going in and basically turning, you know, making carbonic acid. And corals, which have a skeleton, as he pointed out, which is made from calcium carbonate, um, will dissolve um, if there's not sort of something to stop the loss of this stuff, just based on pure chemistry. Um, we, there is virtually no research done in the Gulf on what's, so globally the picture is bleak. Um, and so I'm sure it's also going to be bleak here. Um, there's so things like fish, for example, in uh, many cases can regulate the pH of their blood and kick out the, uh, the ions. Um, but corals don't have a system for regulating the pH in their tissues. And so there's not much that they can do about it. And even with fish, certain phases of their life, like larvae, are particu uh, particularly susceptible to changes in pH for things like smelling reefs when they go to find a home and stuff like that. Um, so the story is not good in terms of uh, pH. Um, and uh, in terms of what's been done in the Gulf, virtually nothing's been done other than one study on the geology of 
where reefs form. And basically the habitat that we have in the southern Gulf is called, a lot of people call it cap rock. It's basically grains of sand that have been cemented together by calcium carbonate. Um, and uh, there's been a guy, Sam Perkis, who did some experiments back in the States with uh, sediments from here. And he showed that these will dissolve basically at the pH levels that we're expecting in the next 100 years. So the substrate that reefs grow on themselves will be gone, never mind the corals. Yes, um, corals uh, have been shown to do well if they have a, a, a substrate to grow on. Mm -hmm. And so one, one way to stimulate them is to dump some navigational hazards into the water. Uh, old boats, whatever, to, uh, to give, uh, give them a place to grow. Is this, a, is this an idea to, uh, to promote uh, recovery of these coral reefs in Bahrain and, and other places? So artificial reefs are something that are very commonly used here in the Gulf as a uh, mitigation sort of technique. Um, I've done a, I haven't talked about it at all here, but I've done a ton of work on artificial reefs and the synopsis of everything that I've done is they're pretty much a waste of money. Um, the amount of area that you're putting in is negligible by comparison to the amount of actual reef habitat that actually does exist on coastlines anyway. And so if you're putting in you know, a few trains or um, cars and shipwrecks, um, the actual amount of habitat that you're adding is minor. Um, the other thing is the stuff that typically grows on artificial substrates differs from what you get on natural reefs anyway, both in terms of the fish communities as well as in terms of the coral communities. Um, and the science of how we actually build artificial reefs well is in its nascent phase right now. Um, there's not a lot known on, you know, what are the optimal materials? What sort of uh, oceanographic conditions should we put, be putting these things in? Um, what's the texture of the substrate itself and the geochemistry and how might that affect, for example, corals and their settlement as larvae and so on and so forth. Um, so it's a, it's a wide open arena um, and I see a lot of people taking, or basically exploiting that uh, lack of understanding right now through consultancies and so on. So there's major companies all around the world that are coming to the Gulf all the time trying to sell their wares and I get calls on a regular basis on this um, and it worries me a little bit. Hi John, great presentation. Um, I was just uh, wondering as ocean temperatures uh, increase globally, do any places become uh, you know, better habitats for uh, corals to start to develop? So there's, um, there are discussions going on about the fact that, okay, so corals are at their, you know, they typically live in the tropics, um, and, you know, there's a band of them around the, the, the earth that sort of stops about here, um, sort of at the Tropic of Cancer or Capricorn. And as the world warms, potentially, um, you know, we'll get a rain shift in corals, so they'll start moving north and south from um, the, the equator. So there's the possibility that they'll start moving, but where you have most of the diversity, um, and most of the coral right now will cease to exist. So you're not really um, compensating. And the stuff that is in high latitudes tends to be like here, low in diversity. You don't get as much, um, uh, as many species as you tend to get in the tropics as well. Dr. Bird, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I know that there is uh, desalination going in the Gulf region because water is desalinated for consumption. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that was considered as a variable because I guess salinity in the water rises and um, does this, uh, um, uh, so the reefs because of that, do they uh, very much progress in their uh, demise? Okay, um, so when you have desalination, uh, the water that's coming out, the effluent, is typically about 10 degrees, depends, uh, about 10 degrees Celsius hotter. So there's a thermal stress, and yes, typically, the, it, or in some systems, it can be saltier as well. For the desalination plants in particular, um, it'll be a more concentrated brine. Um, generally, this will have a localized effect. It depends on the proximity to reefs. Um, for the most part, the, the plants that I've seen around the Gulf aren't built where you have coral reefs anyway. Um, but there are other ecosystems there that could be impacted. Um, and in some cases, you can have a plume. It depends on the volume of water that's going through these systems, but you can have a plume that can extend for many kilometers and have impacts. So for example, in Dubai, I worked on the Palm Island for a couple of years looking at the breakwaters there, as well as a number of other places. And there's a desalination plant sort of uh, just west down the coast, maybe a couple of kilometers, three or four kilometers. 
Um, and what's interesting is if you look at the corals on the palm itself, the, the ones on this side of the palm tend to bleach every summer, and the ones on this side don't bleach every summer. So it suggests that there is probably a thermal effect, or it, it's quite possibly the salinity as well that's having an Im impact on the, the corals on this side. Um, the water is very salty in that area. 